Being revealed for who he is, his Messiah, he's the servant of God, he is God himself, God in the flesh, the word of God, and demonstration after demonstration, proving to be him to be who he is, his God. He's raising the dead, healing the sick, the blind, and so forth. And then in chapter 13, the rejection had gone to the climax. And so now he's concentrating on his disciples, right, in chapter 13. And uh, he's coming to the end, and he says, okay, the hour has come. And he knew there was a, he was going to get betrayed and going to be crucified and so forth. So knowing that that's the truth, that was the reality, he was focusing on his disciples. And he was showing them that no matter what, he was going to love them. It says he loved them to the end. And that's what we find in chapter 13. And here in the last paragraph, uh, verses 31 to the end of the chapter, we find that Jesus is saying, look, I want you to see the motivation behind all that I'm doing and what you should be motivated by. And isn't that the way that we all go by? when we value something, that we really, really value something, then we're motivated to move. You know, if a young man sees a beautiful woman and he quote unquote falls in love, he will do anything and everything, right? Or if we are going to in a business and we see this great, great deal, then we will move heaven and earth to get that deal done because we see it's a great deal. And we're moved by that. Well, Jesus is focusing on his disciples, and he's saying, okay, I want you to really, really be motivated to live the Christian life, to really follow me. And um, it's hard for them to get it through their heads because they're fallen like you and me. So we're going to find that it's difficult for them as well. But he's uh, about motivation. I want you to be motivated powerfully. And then follow me in what I'm doing. But to have people follow is very, very difficult, no? Uh, this next November, we're going to have an election, the presidential election. And the question is, uh, are we going to follow? If the Democrats win, will the Republicans follow? If the Republicans win, will the Democrats follow? <laughs> we probably know the answer, right? No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to get people to follow. And of course, we live in a, in, a, in a fallen world. So it's hard to imagine that everybody's going to follow. But... We can still look for the right motivations to follow. Now, what makes it extra difficult? In uh, Matthew uh, 24, by way of introduction, Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end times before he comes back and uh, how it's going to be. In Matthew 24, in verse 14, he says this. Uh, I'm sorry. Matthew, yeah, Matthew 24, uh, he says that uh, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, and we have this lawlessness today at many, many different levels. And because of lawlessness, we're not going to follow. We're just going to be looking out for number one. And we live in such times. Uh, where lawlessness is everywhere. Everybody's taking things into their own hands. So while we want to follow, there needs to be a caution. There needs to be a caution as to who we're going to follow. But again, because of lawlessness, it says the love of many will grow cold. Uh, verse 11 of Matthew 24, I'm sorry. Matthew 24, verse 11, many false prophets will rise and will mislead many. 
Because lawlessness is increased, verse 12, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Let me just look out for number one because no one is really, really caring for me. You see, Never mind what God says. I'm just going to look out for me. So we have to ask the question of ourselves, really, where am I? Really, where am I? Am I ready to follow and to say even whatever it takes, sacrifice on my part, sacrifice on whatever, but I'm going to follow Jesus? Or are we looking out for number one, like everybody else? Yes, we're supposed to have exercise caution because of where we are. And the thing about it is, we cannot force, listen to this, we cannot force what we think is right. And that's a big, big temptation. You know why? Because we all have a sense of right and wrong. You see? And Jesus gave his example of saying, look, I'm not going to force. I'm going to obey my father even if it means that I get crucified. And I'm going to love my father by obeying him, by trusting him. And as you and I are motivated by the same, then we're able to express and live out the truth without trying to force what is right. And that works with husband, wife, Parent, children, brothers and sisters, friends, church members, employees, employers, all relationships. When we get into the mode of trying to force what we think is right, listen, we are no longer loving. You see, we are no longer loving. And so we ask again, you know, am I following or am I trying to do my own thing? What we find in Matthew or John 13, the last paragraph, verse 31 through 36, is that following Jesus, following Jesus means glorifying God by loving one another, always relying upon Him. You see, we to follow Jesus means that I'm going to glorify God, right? And the way I'm going to glorify God is by loving other people. And in loving other people, I need to be trusting God, not trusting my ability to control, not trusting my ability to force what I think is right. And that is very, very hard. In fact, it is impossible without God. It is impossible. Because I'm driven by rights and wrongs. And Jesus' example is, there needs to be a stronger motivation than rights and wrongs. Because if it's rights and wrongs, brothers and sisters, you and I would already be in hell. Because God knows that we've done plenty of wrong, Right? So what needs to be motiv a stronger motivation is the love and the trust in God, the Father. That's what Jesus is going to demonstrate, you see. And so I find verse 32 or 31 and 32, the motivation and his powerful, powerful motivation. And you're going to see there why I'm saying that. And Jesus, this is Jesus's dream, by the way. Verses 32, 31 and 32, this is Jesus' dream. What's his dream? Glorifying the Father. That's his dream, you see. And it's about loving the Father. That's Jesus' dream. Uh, verses 31, 32, 33, 35, what's Jesus' method? Jesus' method is the love between the Father and the Son. That's his method. The love that there's between the Father and Son is to be the motivation, the method by which we glorify the Father. 
And then what we find then, verse 36 to 38, our need to rely upon Jesus. Our need to rely upon Jesus. So first of all then, we find Jesus' dream to glorify God the Father. Um, and here, uh, it's very odd, by the way, what's happening here, because what has just happened is that uh, Jesus has pointed out uh, Judas is the one that's going to betray him, right? And he tells Judas, what you do, you do it quickly. And then Judas leaves. And when Judas leaves, then we find verse 31, which is like odd. Because Jesus, you're going to go betray me. Now you're going to go betray me. Now go do it quickly. And then look at what verse 31 says. Therefore, when he had gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. What? <laughs> it's craziness. What do you mean? Judas is just going to go betray you, and now you're going to get glorified by that? What in the world is that? And then he says in verse 32, if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. And will glorify him immediately. Man, there's a lot of glory there, right? Glory, 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 glory. Five times glory or glorified. By being betrayed? What in the world going on? <laughs> well, here's the deal. Um, if you take a coach of a team, whether it's basketball, football, whatever, and that coach really, really works hard to train the players. And the players get good and strong, and they work as a team, and they win the championship. Who's glorified? Well, the players get glorified because they won. But who trained them? The coach. The coach gets glorified, right? The players did what they were supposed to. And their talents and their abilities just shine. And they're, man, it was awesome. And then the trainer, wow, he got them through it. He, he guided them. He did everything that was necessary. Well, here, Jesus is saying, okay, that Judas is going on to betray me. Okay. Now things are in line for what? Now the steps are taken like a domino effect. Pow, 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 pow. What's going to happen? Judas is going to go betray me. The Pharisees, the rulers are going to come, take me. They're going to torture me. They're going to crucify me. And I'm going to rise again from the dead. And I'm going to go back to the Father. And all of that. I am, I am going to achieve. I'm going to accomplish what I came for. I came to save mankind. That's what I came for. And I'm going to show that I can do it and I'm going to do it. And by that, I'm going to show all of that is going to reveal what? All of that is going to reveal who I am. I am. The promised Messiah of thousands of years. I am the servant of God of Isaiah 53. I am the son of man revealed in the book of Daniel. I am God himself. As I am able to do this, am I able to go to the cross and accomplish the very thing I came to do? It's going to reveal everything about who I am. You see, by Judas going to betray me, it set in motion all the things. Now the Son of Man is glorified. You see, it's kind of like when a woman delivers a baby. When she's pregnant and she's great with child, she's glorious. She's glorious, giving life to another, to a human being who's going to exist for eternity now. 
That's the way God designed her. You see? She's glorified when she accomplishes what she was designed for. Well, Jesus is saying, because Judas is going on to betray me, I'm going to be revealed for who I am. I'm going to be glorified. And if I accomplish what I was sent here to do, guess who else is going to be glorified? My father. My father is going to be glorified. And why is the father going to be glorified? Because way back from Adam and Eve, God had promised a Savior. And to Noah, a, pro a Savior was pro a promised. To Abraham, to Moses, to David, through all the prophets, God had promised a Savior. And when Jesus accomplishes that, God is revealed as faithful. And when Jesus has to go to the cross... And pay for all of our sins. God's righteousness, his holiness is revealed. You see? So when Jesus accomplishes what he came to do, it glorifies God the Father because it reveals who God is. He's holy and faithful and loving and righteous, completely, totally righteous God that he is. And that's now what we find. That was what verse 31 is all about. Therefore, he has gone out. Uh, that when he had gone out, the Judas gone out. Jesus said, "Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified." You see, you get the sense that Jesus loves the Father. You bet, man. I live for nothing greater than to glorify my Father. As I'm going to the cross, I'm going to suffer, but in that. My father is going to get glorified. Ah. And then from the father's side, verse 32. What does it say in verse 32? And, and, if, uh, and if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Verse 31, the verb is passive. Something's happening. But here the Father takes action. Now, God the Father says, I'm going to glorify you by receiving you unto myself. You're going to sit at my right hand. You're going to be with me, not just as the, not just as the, the eternal word, but now as the human Jesus. That had never happened before in all eternity. But now as the human Jesus, you're going to be in my presence. You're going to be glorified. And I'm going to glorify you immediately. You get the sense that the Father really loves the Son? Yes. You see? And that's what motivated Jesus. And now, from that foundation of eternal Powerful love between father and son and glorification. Now he's going to uh, motivate his, his followers, his disciples. And so he's going to tell them, guys, you know what? I'm going to be leaving. I'm going to be leaving. And I want you to be in, in all this glorification. I want you to be a part of that. And the way you're going to be a part of that is by relating to one another the way my father and I relate. You see? But he's going to be uh, very tender with them. Why? Because he was leaving. You know, when we have a, a, a loved one that's leaving, even if we know they're coming back, it's still like, oh, you're leaving. Oh, okay. And Jesus was saying, I'm about to leave. They didn't know the whole story, but he knew, and it was going to be hard for them. It was going to be confusing for them. It was a transition period. All those three years that he had discipled them, he had been with them, and now he's going to be leaving them. And confusion and, and, and all these frustrations are going to come. So Jesus begins to tenderly, now he says in verse 33, and by the way, this is the way 
when we're going to love people, there needs to be a certain tenderness, right? That we communicate that we really care for them. Even if they do not follow what we're saying, we, we need to communicate love. And look at the way Jesus communicated with his disciples. Little children. They were in their 30s and 40s. But now, here's God speaking to these men. And we're all like little children. And when we don't want to be like little children, we become arrogant. And we think that we're self-sufficient. And we think we don't need God. No, my little children, uh, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you too, where I am going, you cannot come. I'm leaving you. But now, I want you to reflect me. I want you to honor me. And as you honor me, you're going to honor the Father. In fact, that's what glorification is all about, you see. That's what verse 31 and 32 is all about glory. I want you to join in on that glorification. Now, how, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, how did my father, how do my father and I relate? Now look at verse uh, 34, you see. A new commandment, a fresh commandment, uh, an unused commandment, uh, something that's not really been emphasized or heard of before. I'm giving you a new commandment that I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. The word there is uh, agape, the strongest, most powerful love there is. There's many types of love, right? There's eros, the emotional, reactionary, oh, I've fallen in love, boom. <laughs> and many marriages are based on eros, but eros comes and goes. It's an emotional, a good type of love, but it comes and goes. And then there's philos. This is a, a, a friend type of love, a love of a, a father to a son, friends, a philos. But that too can come and go. Agape is that love that sacrifices. It's that love that makes a decision, even if it doesn't feel good. And it's a love that sacrifices profoundly. And he's saying, I want you to agape one another. Even as I have loved you. You see, our sense of love in our times is very, very anemic. It needs vitamins. It needs to be boosted up. It needs to be <laughs> strengthened because our, our sense of love is so, so weak. Very weak. How did Jesus love his disciples? He spoke truth to them. And he lived the truth. Even if it cost him his life, he lived and spoke the truth. In fact, that's what got him in trouble. Right? Because he was doing all kinds of miracles. I mean, he was doing all kinds of service. I mean, you could say he was taking out the trash all the time. And he was washing dishes every day. And he was cooking for everybody all the time. I mean, he was doing plenty of service. That's not what got him in trouble. What got him in trouble is that he was speaking and living the truth. That's the way he was loving them. And so now he says, I want you to love one another the way I have loved you. Because as you do that, that's the way you're going to glorify me. That's the way you're going to glorify the Father. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. Wow. That's the most powerful testimony that we can have as a, as a family, as a church, when we love one another. 
And if we include the definition, I'll expand the definition to say we speak truth to one another. We help one another. Yes, there's grace. Yes, there's mercy. Yes, there's forgiveness. But we keep speaking the truth. You see? Even if it's not popular, but there's loving. And he says, when you do that, when you do that, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you're following me. Is that not what the text says? Verse 35, that's what it says. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, that's God's method. That's Jesus' method. Love one another. Now, Peter, it just whoosh, went over his head. Like, it happens to all of us, right? He, he didn't listen. He didn't ponder to say, why is Jesus talking about glorification? Uh, what's this mushy stuff about love? <laughs> he didn't listen. So now he says, uh, well, what do you mean we can't follow? We follow you all the time. See, he wasn't listening. So, verse 36, and Peter is like, well, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm like him, right? Many of us are, have the same characteristics. We just move straight forward without much understanding. So he says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Take it easy, Peter. Peter didn't give it up, right? Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Uh, Peter thought, I know right and wrong. I know how to do it. And if somebody that doesn't want to do what's right and wrong, I'll take care of them. I'm going to follow you, man, even if it kills me. Peter thought it was just about forcing right and wrong. And if you remember the story, when Jesus actually gets betrayed, what happens? Peter takes out a sword and whack, chops off somebody that guards ear. Because he thought that's love. Trying to force what is right. No. No, Peter. It's about you loving my father. It's about you obeying my father. It's about you trusting my Father. It's about you trusting me, even when life is not working the way you want it to work. But Peter didn't understand that. And many times, we, you and I do not understand that. We think, we know what's best. We know what's right. And I don't care what it takes, I'm going to force it. And if you don't want to listen to it, pew, I'm gone. <laughs> we all do that in one way or another, right? Uh, I laid down my life for you. And even now, Jesus speaks truth to Peter. If I was Jesus, I'd have slapped Peter silly. Man, when are you going to learn, man? Haven't you learned that every time I say something, that's the way it happens? What do you mean? Tsh, shut up! Praise the Lord, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I'd made a mess of things, right? I mean, don't we all get mad real quick? Don't look at me that way like, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course you do. We all get so mad so quickly. We think, oh, I'm going to die because life is not working. Don't you see I'm not loved? I try so hard. Peter had just told Jesus, hey, I'll die for you. And what did Jesus tell Peter? Verse 38. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Listen, Peter. I'm going to tell you some truth. Truly, truly. When God says, truly, truly, man. Take it to the bank. It's a sure, sure thing. And maybe after this time, Peter learned. For he says, truly, truly, I say to you. A rooster will not crow 
until you deny me three times. Tonight, Peter. Tonight. The rooster's not going to crow until three times you will deny me. Mm. What? Yeah. You need to trust me, Peter. Even when life is not working out, you need to trust me. Just like I'm trusting my father. And I have to go to the cross. I'm trusting him. You see? Obeying him. So, that's the way we're going to love one another. You see? That's the way. That's the way. Uh, so, how do we apply this? If we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to glorify God, he's the greatest motivation. Jesus is our example, right? Then we need to love people. Uh, first John, by way of application, first one, uh, first John, first John chapter four, <clears throat> first John chapter four, verse 19 through 21. We love because he first loved us. <clears throat> if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. <laughs> and this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should love his brother also. So you and I, to say, what does it mean to love my neighbor, my family, my church? It's not about forcing what's right and wrong. We can speak what's right and wrong. But it's far more than just speaking it and trying to force somebody else. It's about speaking the truth and trusting God that he knows what's best, no matter what happens. And so continue to speak the truth to one another, supporting one another, forgiving one another, having mercy towards one another, right? That's what it's about. All men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Love one another like I have loved you. So that's the first application. And, of course, <clears throat> that example after example after example, right? Our children, our neighbors, fellow church members that have wronged us or we've wronged them. Or, you know, we woke up on the wrong side of the bed and we came to church all grumpy. And to go back and say, you know, you know what, I, I need your forgiveness. Or to go back and say, you know, you, you offended me and maybe you didn't know it, but... The way you relate to me, you offended me. And I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Because many times, just because we feel something doesn't mean it's accurate. The feelings are real, but our thinking may be off. So we need to be ready to be corrected. But still, to be able to be open and share with one another. You know? Sometimes I'm, I'm afraid to speak to my wife because how is she going to respond? I say, you know, Lord, I, I need to trust you. If she doesn't receive me or I'm mistaken, I, I want to love, Lord. So I have to speak, you see, with my children. Yes, there's right timing, there's sensitivity, maybe, you know, but still. And sometimes we don't say anything because we already know the reaction and it's not the right time. But to love it, one another, uh, it, takes, it takes a lot. It's not the weak type of love that the world offers. The first time something goes wrong, forget you, bye. Uh -uh. Love sacrifices. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second application. Uh, <clears throat> if we're going to love one another, then we must be receiving love ourselves, right? Second Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, 
that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that, here it is, look at this, so that, what's the purpose of it? So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So, uh, are we living predominantly for others? Or are we living for self? We must grow in what it means to live for others and love others. But if we're going to do that, we must be receiving the love of God ourselves. You see? Because if I just determine myself, okay, I'm going to love people. I'm going to love people. And I'm not receiving that love here vertically. I'm going to fizzle out. Before I get to those double doors, I'm going to be out of marbles. <laughs> I'm going to be out of love. You see? I need to be receiving. I need to have this ongoing relationship with God where I am experiencing his mercy and his grace and his love towards me. So that then I can pass it on consistently. You see? So if I don't have this ongoing dependent relationship with God, it's not going to happen. I'm going to run out of energy very quick. But he says there, he died for all so that they will, who live might no longer live for themselves, but live to serve others. And that can become a chore. That can become legalistic. As I said, if we don't have a relationship with God, it's going to become self-determination. I want to love. I want to love. I want to love. I want to sacrifice. I want to do it. <laughs> no. We're going to fail. And then if we stay in that mode and we fail, then we start judging others. They're not loving. See, I'm doing better. See, at least I'm trying. They're not. <laughs> judging other people because we're going by our own self-efforts. No. We need to go back to verse 14 of 2 Corinthians, right? For the love of Christ cons controls us, constrains us, motivates us, propels us as we know the love of Christ. Okay, that's the way we're going to li live for others. Then finally, uh, I harped on this for a little bit because I think it's underneath there in the passage in John, John 13. And that is that uh, love is not about forcing righteousness. But keeping, but keep doing God's will. Even against betrayal and death. Even when we have been wronged. Even when we have been misunderstood. We must continue to trust God and not try to force what is right. I need to keep obeying the Lord, trusting Him, staying soft, you see, not hardened in my heart because I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and it doesn't work because I'm doing it in my own energy, you see. But once I continue to trust the Lord, there's going to be a softness that is there. When somebody goes against me, you know what? I've gone against the Lord, and he had mercy on me. I need to have mercy. That doesn't mean that I say okay to whatever they're doing. No, no. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to get hurt. But I must not try to force what I think is right. Peter, I think, had the wrong idea of love. I'll follow you even to the death, Lord. And, and he even tried, but he was trying to force what was right. No, no. Peter, like I'm trusting my father, and that means I even go to the cross. I suffer and get crucified. That's what you need to do. You need to keep trusting the Father. You obey His will. But it's a choice that we all have to make daily. We have to say, 
I need to trust God. I'm not going to try to force my wife. I'm not going to try to force my husband. I'm not going to try to force my, my children, my parents, my friends. No. God, you know what you're doing. I need to trust you. You see? So love. And when we do that, you know what happens? We glorify Jesus Christ. We glorify Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are reflecting him. We are reflecting Jesus Christ. When we trust him and we obey him, regardless, just like he obeyed the Father, regardless, we glorify Jesus. And Jesus is worth glorifying now and for eternity. Now and for eternity, he is worthy to be glorified. Why? Because he was slain from the foundation of the world. Because he paid for all of my sins. For your sins. He is worthy to be glorified. Will you? Will you? Your choice. So love my